Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Let's just get straight into it. Our consideration tonight is on the blood of Christ as it has power to sanctify the vilest of sinners. God had revealed through Isaiah in uh, chapter 6 through the vision that he first saw and in years to come would write down for our benefit and our consideration. He saw God, the holy uh, king of the universe, lifted up and glorified, surrounded by uh, 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 majestic angels and creatures, and they cried out in the superlative degree that God was holy. They utilized the Jewish uh, uh, linguistic technique of, um, of repetition to the third degree, which is the highest they could go. And they cried out to God that he is holy, holy, holy. And therefore, what that holiness of God logically and correctly struck into the heart of Isaiah, God's set-apart prophet, right? if anyone's holy in the land of Israel, it's him, what struck his heart rightly and correctly and truly and fittingly and appropriately was that God's holiness was a severe, traumatizing, terrorizing, horrifying effect for even the holiest human being. That to be in God's presence, as unmitigated as it was, on a throne, in the throne room, with his, 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 his robe filling the temple and smoke from the incense going up, and the angels didn't even have the gall to look upon him, but covered their face. Isaiah said in that moment, he said, woe is me. It is the prophetical job of one of the Old Testament messengers to go around to the, uh, uh, to the nation and tell them, woe is you, you break God's law. Woe is you, you break his commandment. Woe is you, 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 you pile iniquity upon iniquity upon iniquity and all of your sacrifices are insufficient and unacceptable while you were in such sin. And in that moment, all that he had before him was woe is me. For he's looking upon the holiness of God. In this passage and other passages, God showed to us the necessity of sanctification, or we could say in an English made-up word, you're welcome, holification. That is, if a sinner is to be acceptable in God's presence, not burned up, thrown, consumed under his judgment, then we must be holified ourselves. What What a flame before a dry leaf is. So God's holiness before a sinner is. It is all consuming and destroying. That's the very language of Hebrews itself, which tells us that our God is a consuming fire. It's a good idea to be viciously afraid of him, scared, trembling to your boots, if you have not possessed or been transferred into what we're talking about tonight, sanctification by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, look at verse 12. It says this. We'll look at the fact of it, we'll explain some, and then we'll apply it in a little bit. Hebrews 13, and look at verse 12. It's, it's sort of a, a throwaway line in the middle of a practical exhortation, but the writer of Hebrews says this. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate. We remember that suffering is a part of what it means when we talk about the blood of Christ. He was scourged, he was whipped, he was beaten, he hung there, the blood was dripping, he was pierced with the spear which brought forth blood and water. So when we say that Jesus suffered, think blood. That's right on theme with our series. Jesus suffered. Jesus shed his blood while he was alive and he shed his blood for a, in a particular place. Not just the death of Christ, but the place of the death of Christ. The location of the death of Christ is relevant for our consideration at the moment in Hebrews 13, 12 says, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Through his own blood. Sanctification comes for the people. We'll define that people tonight. The people who are sanctified, who are not consumed by God's wrath, who are made able to enter God's presence, who are welcomed into the gate of the heavenly Jerusalem of glory and heaven to walk beside our king and to receive his blessings and his presence, those people are those who have been sanctified and sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
uh, let us think at the moment about the, 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 the background uh, of this verse and why it even makes any sense. Let's expand our reading. Look back at verse 10. It's a very, very offensive first century thing to say what the writer of the Hebrews says here. We'll explain it though. He says, we have an altar from which who, those who serve the tent, that is the, the tabernacle, the temple, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. He's saying to Christian Jews in the first century, to Christians who were formerly in Judaism, just like Paul and Peter, they lived by the stipulations of the Midrash and the uh, commandments of the Pharisees and the rabbis and the traditions of the elders. They did all that, that, that they were a Jew. And, and they knew that, 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 that Christ had come and paid for their sin. They trusted in him. They were now Christians. They're in church. The context of the whole book of Hebrews is that as persecution mounted up, there was only one religious group in all of the Roman Empire that was given genuine, full, free religious liberty. And it was those who had fought for it, tooth and nail, despite the blood of all of their sons going off to war, to battle the Roman Empire for this, who was the Jewish nation. Because they were refusing to commit idolatry again, worship Caesar, and then go back into exile again. God had taught them the lesson through the first exile. They were not going to commit idolatry. They, they fought for the religious freedom to worship one true God and not add any other gods to that list and not worship Caesar over God. They, 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 they sanctified God's name and they fought for that right, which meant that as the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians, the Christian former Jew was tempted to not get your head chopped off at the altar of Caesar for not worshipping him, but just step over this way a bit and say, Jesus in my heart, Moses out in front. I'll go to temple, act like a Jew, I'll keep free, I'll keep my head. Doesn't Jesus want me to keep my head? But in my heart, I'll know I'm a Christian. And the writer of the Hebrews has this whole passage, this whole book, this whole discourse, which was probably a sermon first, to exhort the believer in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, but the context is the Jew. None of the Old Testament system, though it was exclusive and golden and glorious and angel delivered, and, and there was all of these wonderful bloody sacrifices made, and the incense, and I've seen, you know, the tabernacle, I mean, the, the holy table, everything. Oh, I know, it's got so much glory, but it has nothing compared to Jesus. In fact, to now profess Jesus and then go back to what you know was always pointing to him, to go back to the shadow which has no substance without Jesus. Now that Jesus has come, that's actually an act of idolatry, just like worshipping Caesar at first. So he says, don't you realize that the holy set apart Levites would be under church discipline if they tried to take communion with us? The high priest, your former senior pastor of the denomination in Israel, the high priest who serves at the table, who serves in that, and he insults him again. He calls their temple that he used to love so much, the golden, glorious wonder of the ancient world built by Herod the Grand Architect, the golden temple. He says that tent thing, you know, canvas, zips. Oh, they used gold and stone, did they? Well, to me, it's a tent, right? It's temporary, that old thing. He says, those who serve in that tent, the high priest in the temple, he's not holy enough to take communion with you and me. He would be barred from the church communion table. He can't take of the Lord's Supper. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. They may have all of the external ceremonial holiness and sanctification. But if they have not placed their faith in Christ, they don't have the one sanctification that now matters and the one sanctification to which all other bloody sacrifices pointed to, which is the sanctification through Christ's blood. So they're not welcome among the people. They're outside of the camp. They're outside of the people of God now. Because the people of God have changed definition in the new covenants coming. So let's keep on going. He says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So also Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify people through his blood. Let me just show you the illogical, nonsensical thing that this writer just said. 
He goes back to Leviticus 16, and, uh, uh, verse, uh, which was the chapter where God instructed Moses about the Day of Atonement, the, one of the highest holy days of the entire Jewish calendar, when all of that year's sin was placed upon different animals' heads. Uh, certain of them were killed. Their bloods were taken inside. They even had to uh, c- uh, uh, cleanse the temple itself, the tabernacle itself, and then, and then the, the sins of the people, and then the sins of the high priest. And then finally, he could go in and make final atonement. One animal ran off into the wilderness and was chased. But in all of this procedure and ceremony, God was showing that that, that, that one time a year, the the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy section of the temple and sprinkle the blood with, with thickening, blinding incense burning so that they couldn't see God's presence and so that they were shielded and they put blood upon the altar, upon the, uh, rather, the, the Ark of the Covenant, asking God for another year's mercy. Please, please forget our, mer- our sins of the last year. Let the blood go upon the table and spread there and see it, Lord God, and be merciful to us. And he would back up out of the holy place. Once a year, the writer of Hebrews is referring to that. And he says, the, the, the bodies of the animals that are shed and killed and whose blood is put into a bowl that the high priest then carries into the holy place, even though it's holy blood and a holy sacrifice of a holy man in a holy place, all of that, yet there is an unholy portion of that sacrifice. And the unholy portion of that animal who carried and was imputed to all of our sins, so now the, the guilty animal has an unholy part. And you can probably guess what it is. It's his intestines and it's dung, Le- Leviticus 16 says, and it's skin. All right, lump all of that into a, into a pile and take that stinking, disgusting pile, give it to another Levite who, who takes it and by taking it becomes unholy and then goes so far away from the temple that he's now outside of the suburbs. He's now in like rural Israel. Send him right outside the camp, way away from everybody else. He throws it all down and he burns that dung, innards, and skin. And then he has to wash because he touched the things that were so filthy. And then he could come back among the people. Now the logic of the writer of Hebrews says this. We have a table, a worship, an access to God more sanctified than the high priest has going into the holy place. You know why? Because Jesus was made like the dung and the intestines and the waste and the mess of the animals that carried all of the sin of the entire Israelite encampment. Doesn't that make absolutely no sense at all? How does that qualify us for a greater sanctification? What is he really calling the Jew to? Uh, The the Jew's sitting there, uh, uh, strained in his conscience. Should I go back to temple and hide my Jesus worship? Should I stay in church and get butchered by Romans? It's not really a competitive question to me. But my conscience is paying. I hear hear the letter of the Hebrews is is really, it's striking me. I'm a Hebrew, here it is. And then the writer says, says all of this. Here's what I'm supposed to believe. That instead of a holy building with a holy man, in holy clothings, with holy sanctified instruments, and a holy knife, and a holy bowl, with a holy altar, and holy blood from a holy animal. Instead of all of that, I'm supposed to come here to church, which is usually in an unholy place, not the temple. It's in an unholy place. There's Gentiles here, unholy people. I'm supposed to eat a table with Gentiles called the Lord's Supper, an unholy meal, I'm supposed to listen to teaching from an unholy person. And he tells me, the reason I can feel so holy is that our Messiah, the Holy One, is like dung. Welcome to the logic of the gospel. It's foolish if what you want is some kind of religious wisdom. Look somewhere else. It's insulting if what you want is some kind of ceremonial, impressive sanctification among the people of the earth. You're looking in the wrong place. But if you want the foolishness of the world, the scum of the world... The, un, the, the, the foolish things, those things that are not being utilized by God to give glory to himself. If you want the place where, where the most holy being became the, the, the scum of the earth in order to make the scum of the earth, you and me, holy in God's sight, then welcome to the gospel. It is called the foolishness of God, which is far wiser than the wisdom of man. It is called the, the weakness of God, which is in fact far more powerful than the strength of mankind. This is the gospel. Jesus was accursed for us. 
He was that lamb and its blood in the temple. He was that goat driven off into the wilderness. He was also the accursed, cut off, disgusting pile of dung burned outside the city. In other words, Jewish Christian, the writer of the Hebrews is saying, if you're afraid that by naming Christ, you're going to be mistreated and cut off from your people, welcome to Jesus' family. He beat you there. He's waiting for you outside the camp. He didn't even die gloriously in the temple, like a great martyr, like those, like those Maccabean revolters too, who fought off the Romans in order, to, in order to establish purity for the temple, and many of them died in the temple. What a glorious way to go for a Jew. No, Jesus was butchered naked publicly outside the camp, out on the road somewhere, like the burnt dung. That's where Jesus is. So that then marks your life, Christian. You're a cut off one. Get used to the world's disgust and, and rebuke and, and, and opposition and disrespect. Yes, our Holy One was burned outside the city, the imagery goes. This is a great call to humility, to receiving persecution, to accepting, to be the, the, the scum of the world. But the point that is made there that the proud religious doesn't see, as he's asking, if all of this Sanctified ceremony is missing at church. How does the scum of the earth, holy one, make us holy? Right there in the last phrase. He has sanctified the people through his own blood. The blood of Jesus was so holy, imperfect, uh, perfect, undefiled, unblemished. It was perfect. So holy, in fact, that it needed none of the rigmarole or ceremony going on about it for it to be the most holy, purifying, sanctifying substance that could ever flow on this earth. The, the, the blood of goats, like, it, it, look, it's a goat. It's got part of its own uh, bodily fluid still stuck to its... They have to wash it before they bring it... They, they need all the gold and the temple. They need all that to make it look impressive, because it's not. Jesus can be, can be scorned shamed before Gentiles and Jews, before his kinsmen and his enemies, mocked, abandoned by his friends, spat upon, beard ripped out, stripped naked, put up publicly, pinned to a rugged cross, already used by other criminals, and die there in shame. And the most unholy sight in the world, because there sheds forth the holy blood of Christ, is still the most holy, sanctifying event in all the world. It is, it is not just that Jesus' blood is sanctified, and so we should hold it in a vial somewhere, and we should preserve it, we should think of it highly. It is, the, it is the source of sanctification for you and I. It has so much power that it is not just sanctified, like, like other instruments and implements and uh, uh, you know, uh, elements of, uh, of worship in the Old Covenant. Remember in the tabernacle, they had holy prongs, they had holy tongues, they had holy bowls, they had the lot. Everything was sanctified. But if those things touched an unholy thing, they became unsanctified and needed washing. Jesus' blood is not sanctified in the sense that it can be in the temple, it can be in God's presence as long as nothing else touches it. Rather, like the flesh of the sin offering in Leviticus chapter 26, it is so holy that anything that touches it becomes holy. It's not just sanctified in itself, it, is, it has sanctifying power and therefore can reach out to you and I and sanctify us along with him. The blood of Christ sanctifies the people of God. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 29, verse 20 and 21, the, the, those who served in the temple had to, we've looked at this previously, they had to wash in water, the Levites. But not only did they wash in water, verse 20 and 21 tell us also that a ram was killed and some of its blood was sprayed upon the altar, poured there, and the rest of it was touched on the right ear of the priests and on the right thumb of the priests and the right foot of the priests. That was God marking out this person for himself and possessing them as his tool and instrument. That is that by the blood on the ear or the head was being told, what you know, think, believe belongs to me. You are devoted to me. What you do with your hands in your work, you belong to me. You're a Levite. You work in the temple. Where you go with your feet is up to me. You belong to me. You labor for me now. That is that the blood of Christ, sorry, the blood of the lambs in the Old Testament, the ram in that situation was symbolizing a consecration, or we could use the language, a devotion, 
a commitment of that person to a certain task and a certain job and a certain place in a certain way. They belonged to God in the use and for the service in his temple. And this is what we are told, that the blood of Jesus, surrounded by all sorts of unholy elements in that circumstance on the cross, the blood of Jesus also does that to us. It makes us able to be in God's presence by sanctifying us, by making us holy, by marking us out for devotion to God and usefulness for God, so that we are fit to be in his presence because our guilt is washed away, and we are fit for usefulness for God because our impurities are being washed away. This is what it means to be sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's consider first the fact that <coughs> the blood of Jesus Christ sanctifies us objectively, absolutely, and instantaneously. Theologians will use the language of sanctification, and there's biblical warrant for this. It's all over the New Testament. Sanctification to, to mean not just that we are set aside to God, whatever that means now, but sanctification to mean sort of the lifelong process of growing in Christ's likeness, and we're going to look at that. But in another way, the, the, the theologians distinguish and say there's other passages in the New Testament which talk about an objective, absolute, instantaneous sanctification. And that is what they call positional sanctification. Uh, there is experiential sanctification, practical sanctification, how you're living your life. But first of all, there is positional sanctification that where your soul is in relation to God is no longer accursed, cut off, and out. It is near, it is blessed, it is sanctified, it is made holy. You are placed into the presence of God. You are sanctified positionally, absolutely, and objectively. This means that the Christian on your worst day, after your worst week, when your faith is at its weakest and, and you don't even feel that you're clinging on to God's promises anymore, it just feels like there's one thread of them still attached to your back. That's all you've got. And you feel as if you're, you're half a day away from your trials, from your stresses, from your uh, emotional uh, putting out, from your labor, from your sin, from your, your, your forgetfulness about God's promises and commands. You feel that you're probably six to 12 hours away from absolute and utter apostasy. You're going to fall away and the devil will cackle as he takes you to hell. On that day, you are no less positionally sanctified than on the day that you were bringing people to Jesus, you preached in the streets, you went to church twice, you got baptized, you took communion, and you recited the entire Bible to yourself in the mirror. No less sanctified positionally. And that is because the first element, the first basis of our positional sanctification, the only basis of our positional sanctification, the first and most important consideration of our sanctification is it is grounded and based in the positive, legal righteousness of Jesus Christ who gives that righteousness to you and I. That's the first way that the blood of Jesus sanctifies us. We have a passage we can read from the life of a great Baptist, uh, his name was John Bunyan, my, my John the Baptist. You may be more holy than me, you like the Bible guy. This is my guy, my John the Baptist. John Bunyan was uh, imprisoned for his, uh, for his preaching without a license from the uh, English uh, uh, government, uh, my kind of guy. He spent many years in prison, and that's where he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, the, the most popular book in the English language outside of the Bible. He also wrote an autobiography and a testimony called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, and I recommend every Christian read it, especially if you struggle with your assurance in Christ. In it, he sort of details his conversion, and it's, it's hard to know when he got saved because it sounds like he has a, conversion, a converting experience and believes the gospel, and then he just talks about feeling useless and powerless and absolutely run down in weakness and downtrodden for years. And then he details another joyful experience he has. I, I don't know when he was saved. I know he was like us, right? <laughs> a sinner saved by grace. This is what he says one day. He was consistently and continually shaken. He uses the language of being thundered by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit as he read his Bible. And he feared every day as if God was about to strike him dead and damn him. Every, every time he opened the Bible, it's as if right now, this book is too holy for me. He's about to kill me. And he's struck with this. He says, every little touch would hurt my tender conscience. 
is on a walk. It's but one day, as I was passing in the field, and that too with some dashes still on my conscience, fearing lest yet all was not right, I just feel terrible walking along. Suddenly, this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And I felt as if with the eyes of my soul, I saw Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There, I say, was my righteousness. So that wherever I was, or whatever I was doing, God could never say of me, John lacks my righteousness. For there it was right before him. I also saw moreover that it wasn't my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor my bad frame of heart that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8. And then he goes and, and runs home and opens his Bible and looks for that passage somewhere in the Bible, and he stumbles upon 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. And because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The ground of our positional sanctification is the imputed, gifted, given, perfect righteousness of Jesus, which is Jesus himself in heaven, unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why you're positionally holy, no matter how you feel, no matter how you sin. First Peter speaks of this, and he, he calls us, uh, in First Peter, Peter writes to the elect exiles, all throughout Asia Minor. He says, to the elect exiles, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with His blood. In this instance, it would be wrong to follow the order and say, sanctification in the spirit means my life of lived holiness and obedience to Jesus. Oh, that sounds like the same thing. For the sprinkling of his blood. No, I am elect for the initial positional sprinkling of Christ's blood, which imputes to me his righteousness. That's why his blood sanctifies me first and foremost. The positional sanctification of the believer happens upon faith in Christ, where the Spirit sprinkles Christ's blood to our soul, and we are there with God because we are there in Christ. That is the positional, objective, instantaneous, initial act of God's sanctification to us. But secondly, it is also the fact that sanctification in the Scriptures sometimes mean the beginning work of God in our lives. That is, a, it's almost like a saint is standing upon an entire, a huge, a huge, a, a, on, the, on top of a mountain. And, and, and our salvation is sort of the moment like the older brother who nudges his younger brother. And then he doesn't stop. He's found at the bottom. Days later, when the parents finally come down and, and he pops up and says, that was fun, let's do it again, right? There's no way of stopping that process. It's happening. He's falling. He's stumbling. He's dying. He's dr uh, dying. He's falling. He's sliding. It, it, it's as if you can read theologians. That there's, this, there's this sense in the New Testament that sanctification sometimes in the New Testament is that God is saying that he pushes us into a new existence, into a new spiritual momentum. It's, a, it's the beginning of the progress and the process that will occur all of our life. And it's that sense that, that sometimes uh, we should think of in the second uh, uh, sense, which we must think of our sanctification as that which Christ did to us at our conversion, upon faith, immediately, but it was not an immediate finished positional act, it was the beginning, it was the turning of the wheel, it was the, the starting of the process that would become lifelong. In that sense, we have all been sanctified by Christ's blood, uh, the Baptist Catechism, very similar to other Reformed Catechisms, a question and answer study tool. It asks this question. What is sanctification? Well, sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God. And we are enabled more and more and more to die to sin and live unto righteousness. 
There's a follow-up question. What are the benefits with, uh, uh, which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? Well, the benefits which in this life accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, an increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. What God did as he sprinkled the blood of Christ upon you, what the Holy Spirit did when he sanctified you in the heavenly places, was he began a work of God in your life that will go on until you die, whereby he renews you into the image of God, whereby he enables you to put sin to death and start obeying the commandments of God. And in his doing that, he brings forth into your life joy, assurance of God's love, peace of mind, and a, and a walking with the Holy Spirit. This is the work of God's free grace called sanctification. Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul speaks this, this way when he's speaking to the elders and speaking of the church as a people that, that God has sanctified, that is, beginning the work of sanctification, and he has done the first step in making them holy in life and behavior, he says this, I commend you. This is, this is his last words. As he's leaving them, he thinks he's going to go die. He says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. By this kind of sanctification, we mean that God sets aside our soul at conversion. At regeneration, our souls change, our heart erupts, our, 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 our inward affections and our desires and our hopes, dreams, goals, those sorts of things change. They are transformed after godliness. Now, they're not fully seen in all of our life, and I'm not talking about a full-bodied maturity and sanctification yet. First, what God does to us is positionally sanctify us and then initially sanctify us. Begin the process that is going to, to start bearing fruit in our lives. We could say it this way, that, that after positionally sanctifying us, absolutely, objectively, instantaneously, God then also sows the seeds into our new heart that over time will grow and bring forth blooming flowers of beauty. God begins the work in us. He has sanctified us positionally. Hebrews 12 verse 14 speaks warningly this way. To Christians neglecting church, the means of grace, and the Bible. Those neglecting the preaching of Jesus Christ, which the Christian Jews in the book of Hebrews were tempted to do. He says to them, strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's not your initial positional sanctification. That is not the objective righteousness of Jesus Christ in your account sanctification. Because you can't strive for that sanctification. You can't strive for that holiness. And you can't strive for that righteousness. He's commanding us in a warning way. Strive for that which no man will enter God's presence without. That is a life set apart, devoted to, flowering in holiness unto God. God did it in us. He expects it to bear fruit. Romans 6 says it in this way, in verse 22. He says, Now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. Listen to this. The fruit now that you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. The end of sanctification is eternal life. The result of sanctification is eternal life. Did you hear that? You go to heaven at the end of your sanctification and no one gets to heaven without sanctification. One of the necessary steps for you as a Christian before heaven, before eternal life, is sanctification. Now he's by no means, but it's Paul, this is Romans. He's not saying that sanctification earns merit. He's saying that those who have been positionally sanctified in Christ by his righteousness imputed to them, one of the lots that God gives 
every one of us to walk is sanctification, then we die. It's no more meritorious than if I said this, you have to die to go to heaven. Right? And no, one, no one's thinking that I'm saying dying earns you a place in heaven, do you? But you can't get to heaven unless you're dead. And if you're alive when he comes back, he kills you and you get resurrected in the moment. That's called the twinkling of the eye, the, the explosive resurrection and glorification that happens at his return. Yeah, everybody other than that generation, you've got to die to go to heaven. It's just a step that you have to go through and no one will go to heaven without dying. And just as true, no one will go to heaven who has not experienced sanctification. Now, you might die a second after putting your faith in Jesus and you experience, well, you wouldn't say you experience it, but you had one second of sanctification. But that's not you because you're right here and you've been here for at least 30 minutes. So, so let's get out of the ridiculous exceptions and say every Christian who lives any life between faith and death must walk sanctification, or Paul says, and Hebrews says, you don't see God. There is no Christian who gets saved and then goes to heaven after a long life who was not sanctified in this life. Why? Because he has not just positionally sanctified our souls, he has also set in motion within us an unchangeable and unstoppable living process called sanctification, which will change your life. So these, is what, this, these are what God has done. These are benefits of sanctification that are done to us. He changes your status. He starts the work in you. Now our third consideration is our, our, develop, our contribution to, our steps taken in the walk of sanctification in this life. And in this sense, we talk about sanctification as an ongoing work or progress of God, which we are called to participate and cooperate in. One of the important editorial decisions that the writers of that old catechism made back in the 1600s they intentionally decided to use two different words for justification and sanctification. Justification, that is being declared righteous in Christ upon faith, because it's an instantaneous thing that doesn't change, they called it an act of God. Justification is God's gracious act of God, whereby he considers Christ's righteousness to be mine by faith and faith alone, due to no merit in myself. An act of God that's done once it's done. They intentionally used the language of a work of God to talk about sanctification. Because the work of God is never done. He is doing. It's not right to say God is doing justification in you. No, no, it's instantaneous. It is right, however, to say that he is doing, working, present tense, future tense, past tense. He is working holiness into you like a baker will need leaven or flour into the dough. A lifelong process. Joel Beakey, speaking of this, says, Jesus is not just the door to heaven. He is. As soon as you're in him, you're in. He says he's not just the door, though. He is also calling himself the way to heaven, the path and the road to heaven. That is that anybody walks Anybody who walks through the door of Christ into justification and positional sanctification are now on the path, the way, the road of Jesus Christ, which is the stepping by stepping by stepping way of sanctification. He's not just the door, he's also the way to heaven. Indeed, he is the glory of heaven itself. So that faith enables us to reach to Christ for grace and it enables our heart to sweep off the effects of sin. Saving faith does both. Thomas Boston, a Puritan, said this. By our communion with Christ, the believer launches forth into an ocean of happiness. He is led into a paradise of pleasures and has a saving interest in the treasure hidden in the field of the gospel, the unsearchable riches of Christ. That is to say that when we talk about ongoing, progressive, lifelong process of sanctification, 
We don't mean anything different than looking to Christ and being made and formed after his image. That's really definitionally what it is. Now, as far as effort and steps to take, there's many other things. Attend church, sit under rebuking preaching, read the word of God, pray daily, be it communion, witness baptisms, praise God and evangelize. These are all the, effect, the, the ministry of God's grace in your life that if you do them, lo and behold, you're going to find yourself worlds more holy than you currently are. Sin tasting much less pleasing than it currently does. The world much, le- much more dusty in the mouth than you used to be satisfied with it. That will happen. But what we're doing in listening to preaching and what we're doing when we're taking communion and what we're doing when we're praying and what we're doing when we're reading the Bible and what you're doing when you're spending time with other Christians, it's not, it's not a sacerdotal, sacramental, pagan superstition. Got 30 minutes of fellowship in tonight and it's with a guy I hate. It's got to count for something. I sat under preaching and I, I, I was busting for the loo the whole time. More penance. Uh, We took communion. I snuck extra bread, topping up somehow. It is not as if grace is sort of at the other end of a tap, that if we turn it, we get more, we'll walk away more holy. What we're doing when we're reading the Bible is saying to God, Oh Lord, open your word that I might behold wondrous things about Christ. When you're sitting in preaching, what you're saying is, Give us Jesus Christ, Lord God. Preacher, give us Jesus Christ. Show us Jesus from the word. Give us him to feast upon and to hold. Because as we behold him, our hearts conform to his shape. Our our holiness begins to leak and exude through all of our affections. That's the effect of holiness. Uh, Thomas Watson, I believe it was. You won't know if I misquote anyway. Thomas Watson, he says, (laughs) it is him. He says, sanctification is like a a cup of wine in in a jar glass jar of water, as you pour it in, it, it affects everything by its intinction. It, it, it changes the smell, the color, the, 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 the flavor of every drop in that glass. And so it is with sanctification in the soul. One of them, the Puritans said, what, what health is to the heart, so holiness is to the soul. It leaks into everything. It it feeds everything organically and supernaturally. So so in your pursuit of sanctification, seek not to establish your own righteousness like Bunyan, or you'll repeat his errors and live without the joy, without the assurance, without the peace, and without the in-stepness with the Holy Spirit that is a fruit of genuine sanctification. Rather, instead of establishing a righteousness which can positionally sanctify you and also without trying to start some non-existent process in yourself no recognize God has begun the process by making you holy and beginning you upon that path rather respond to God's grace receive God's grace and then and then seek to cut sin out of your life cut wasteful idle things out of your life in order to see Christ more clearly Behold the grace of God put on display in Jesus Christ more purely and thereby have holiness sifting through, fluctuating through, flowing through, touching every area and every part of your life. Christ's blood sanctifies us by giving to us the Holy Spirit who enables all of these things to be true. Now, if you're outside of Jesus, if you're not a believer, if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, or if in calling yourself a Christian, you acknowledge there is no seed of holiness in me. I don't have that thing without which I won't see the Lord. I'm not changed. I'm not less worldly. I'm not more godly than I was when I first began to believe. That's not me. Praise God and bless you for being so honest with yourself now. The consideration for us coming from Hebrews 13 is this. If created, fallen, animal blood could enable a sinful to the core man, he was given a hat and a robe called a high priest, but at the core he was just a man. If it could grant him, this animal blood, could grant him access into God's presence in the most holy place of that tabernacle and temple. If God, by his grace, was willing to do that 
ceremonially. How much more must the undefiled, divine man, blood of Jesus, by the grace of God, sanctify the worst and vilest of sinners for an eternal time and an infinite gift of grace? How much more? You have not committed any kind of sin or too many sins that make you so unholy you can't be sanctified by Christ's blood. You have committed sin. You are unholy. You need sanctification. But, but put on display at the cross of Jesus where he died for us, being raised to life again. There is now this spiritual promise of the blood of Jesus being able to sanctify any body who comes to God by faith in Jesus Christ. Call out to Jesus. Say, oh, God, man, despised and defiled by the world, the unholy scum thrown off outside of the camp, killed in shame, holy one, source of all sanctification, ground of all boasting, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption for sinners. Please plead for me. Please bring me into God's presence. Please wash me, clean me, purify me, set me apart, devote me to God, sanctify me, and he will. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful that you are gracious, not only to spare us from hell, but to grant us the keys of heaven. Not only to spare us from your wrath, but also shed abroad upon us the most intense delight of your heart. You've made us not just forgiven servants or acquitted enemies. You didn't just leave us alone, but you have granted to us to become children. You have granted to us to spend eternity in your presence, beholding you in the face of Jesus Christ, in a sinless, suffering-less experience. Father God, we praise you for this, knowing that our praises will always fall short of your full deserving. We thank you, Lord God, that not only have you done this, but you did it through the treasured, loved, begotten Son, your only son. We thank you that you enacted this reality in this gospel through his blood, by his death, because of his holiness and righteousness in his life. We thank you, Lord God, for this blessing, this gift which leaves us lost for words. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you put all the, all the writings we would ever need, describing, explaining, applying all of the reality of Christ's death for us. You filled men to write down on pen, with, with, with pen on paper what would become our most holy, holy scriptures. We thank you for these words, Lord God. We thank you for preserving them, for bringing them into our language at this end of history, where we are now. We thank you for the blessing and the conviction of these people even present with us, Lord God, that they desire the word. Thank you for the, 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 the word that has gone forth tonight, and we ask that you would bless it to our hearts Make us more sanctified in practice now that we recognize how sanctified we are in our position. Father God, please, if there are those who are not sanctified at all, who are unholy and still far off and still cut off and still, still unholy, would you make them right in this moment to believe in Jesus and then in that same moment perfectly sanctified in Jesus? We pray all of these things knowing that you are a merciful God who hears our prayers as we pray them in Christ's name. And everybody said...